maybe. Okay. Hopefully that continues to work as we talk. Well, welcome to the line, Matt. Thank um, you. I'm here with Matt Williams with uh, Triaxle. Triaxle. So, Triaxle app, whatever yeah. you refer to it as. Triaxle app. Um, wh- where do people find that online? You on your app store, you simply search Triaxel. It's the only Triaxel app that will come up and, and you can download it or go to triaxel.com. Okay. Well, we, uh, we've we been talking for a little while here and uh, um, you have some, some interesting uh, things to say. Even I think even your app and what you guys do, we're going to talk about that a little bit, um, is also an interesting concept and, and what you have going on there. I actually love it because it's solving a real problem. Sure. So that's pretty cool. And uh, we're just going to get right into it and have an honest conversation. Look so, forward to it. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, you um, are here locally in Pennsylvania. You know, usually we're somewhere like Georgia or Tennessee or, uh, you know, I don't know. We've done podcasts all over the country. But so it's kind of nice. You're here in, in our offices. Um, so I appreciate that you came down here to have this conversation with us. So... Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how you got here and, and what, what Matt's origins are to get to wearing a triaxle polo in Black Line's office. Well, it's a long, long story. <laughs> well, you have 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> it took 20-some years. I'll try to try to cram 20-some years into 15 minutes. Uh, basically, I was a high school kid who couldn't sit still, couldn't focus, got in trouble, uh, you know, goofing off in school. I just really wasn't into... Um, you know, the academics. I excelled in my shop classes. I lived in wood mm. shop, masonry, metal shop. All A's teachers love me, uh, but I went upstairs into the academics and I would sleep and, and and just couldn't focus on what I was doing. So it was very clear to me at a young age that I was destined to be in a hands-on profession. I, it was very clear to me I was not going to go to college to, to sit at a desk right. for the rest of my life. And, right. and that was obvious. So in high school, as soon as I got my license at 16, I got a summer job working for a contractor. Started off sweeping floors, pulling wires, um, and I just had the desire to learn more. I wanted to understand how to frame a roof. How you know? How do you do this? How do you put siding on? I just was hungry to learn, and I think the the guy that I was working for at that time appreciated that. And I was a 16 year old kid that in the summer actually showed up to work at 7 a.m. for the entire summer and. And I got that kind of respect and it, and it, you know, I was allowed to have that job. Um, right. And then, you know, school comes back around the next fall and I was kind of bummed. I kind of just wanted to be going back to work. Um, so I, I just worked through high school. I always had jobs and, and primarily in the construction field. Um, I went to Montana State, Bozeman, for one year after graduating high school. And that was primarily driven by... Uh, in Montana and, yeah. and a buddy of mine or, uh, you know, a friend of mine was going out there and he said, Hey, why don't you come out? And I was like, I, all right. So I applied, I got accepted. I figured what the heck and had a great time hiking, you know, skiing and, and living the Montana life for a year. But I realized it is pretty cool. Out it, there. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I haven't been back since I know it's changed a lot. Uh, you know, it's, it's getting very populated like everywhere else, but it's just amazing. And I, yeah. and I had a blast out there and I actually wanted to stay out there but I could not, uh, I couldn't find a job at yeah. the end of that semester. Like even at a hoagie shop or like a bike shop, all the jobs were taken by the other, you know, college students that were there. So I ended up coming home and, and I kind of felt like when I left there that I probably wasn't coming back because I did right. school for one year and it was the same, same thing as, as high school. It just wasn't for me. And I remember sitting at, you know, in one of my classes and they basically gave us a book and said, you need to circle what you want to do. Cause I went in, like I didn't have a, I didn't have a major. I was just doing my core classes. Right. And they said, you need to sit down and kind of pick your major. And I was looking <clears> at <throat> helicopter pilot or uh, construction, like project manager. And like looking at the two of those, I'm like, well, I guess it'll be one of those. But when it came down to it, I just didn't feel like it was for me. And, yeah. and that summer I went back to work and I was making money. And I told my parents, I said, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to take a year off. I'm not going back. And you know, and they're like, so you were like the original gap year student you know that's a thing now sure they say you know let's let's have a gap year um so you were probably one of the first that Uh, well i think deep down i knew i was never going back but that was just my way of easing them into (laughs) into that and not dropping it on them 
And my parents are great. They're very supportive. And as long as I'm working, being productive, they, they you know, they don't tell me what to do. They never did. As long as I was, yeah. you know, not getting in trouble and I was taking care of myself, uh, they were very supportive. So, you know, I think there was a little bit of, I don't think you should do that. But I think they also saw in me that I was a worker. I wasn't yeah. just taking a year off to sit on the couch and, and do <coughs> nothing and hang out with my buddies. I was working. I was making money yeah. and I wanted to keep doing that. So uh, 19 years old, I was working with a buddy. We ended up parting ways. We were actually going to go partners. And he, at last minute, said he did not want to do that. And I was kind of devastated. I, I didn't really know what working for myself or not working with him looked like. I was definitely more um, business-minded than he was, but he was right. very skilled. He taught me a lot of things. So we split. Long story short, I ended up just starting my own business unofficially. You know, I didn't file the paperwork. I was just kind of working for myself. And, and it, what, what trade was this business I, I was in? doing roofing. I started off as a roofer. Wow. And um, I did that. For so the, I did that in high school for like two summers, and I knew that that was not what I wanted to do the rest of my life. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a brutal business. It's a physical. You know, you're, you're, on, you're shoveling snow off in the winter just, yeah. to, just to make a buck that day so you can do that roof or you're, you're Well, you can make quite off. a few bucks roofing. That was why I did it a couple of summers. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So I started off as a roofer and eventually got into, you know, doing carpentry and decks and just always wanted to expand. And, now, did you grow more. up in any kind of like, did, did your mom or dad do any trade work or anything like that? Or you just no. started learning I by just, doing? I just started learning by doing. And wow. I just started learning by doing. My dad owned an industrial supply business and my mom worked for MetLife. And okay. neither one of them were in the trades. And I just... I just always liked working with my hands and building things. Even when I was yeah. a little kid, before I was doing work, I just liked being outside and building things, and that just that just kind of carried. Okay. So wow. Um, so you're on the roof, and and you're doing that. You kind of ended up being on your own, not by choice, but um, yeah. And so where do where do we go from there? Uh, where do we go from there? Ended up. Um, so. I was uh, when I when I split from the guy that I was supposed to go partners with. We were working for a, a roofing company in Scranton. and we were we were working for him as a sub. Okay. So when we when we parted ways, I ended up working for this guy as a sub, and I had one buddy working for me at the time, Mike, and we were getting a lot of sub work for him. Well, like six months later, we end up having a falling out. What happened was a compressor got stolen out of the back of my truck that oh, wow. was owned by that guy. And he was cool with it. So, you know, he said, ah, shit happens, no big deal. Well, then we had a discrepancy in pay a couple of weeks later. And then he starts saying, well, you, uh, you had that compressor stolen, so I'm not paying you this much. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so we parted ways. And although I was working for myself, I was a subcontractor for this guy. So the right. moment that we parted ways, I had no work. I had nothing. I didn't know where I was going. The way my memory tells me, and I don't, and I believe this to be true, and I don't believe I'm fabricating it to make a great story, but that night I'm sitting at the dinner table basically going, what am I going to do? What, like, I have no work tomorrow. And a family friend, uh, Mark Davis, called me and said, hey, we'd like you to do that roof that you gave us a price on. So like a month or, month or so before that, right. I had given him a bid. He heard I was starting a roofing business, and I <clears> gave him a price. And, and he called me that night and he said, hey, we'd like you to do this roof. When can you do it? I said, I know this sounds kind of funny, but I could be there tomorrow. I was never slow after that. that That's that, awesome. That was day one. And we were working on his roof. Uh, a local contractor saw us working, stopped by and said, hey, I didn't know you were in the area. We're looking for a roofer. And I started working for him. And we were, we were never slow after that. Wow. I was never without work. So it was very, it was a scary time and it worked out. And looking back all these years, every time I got scared, it always worked out. So it's pretty cool. Wow. So you went from working with your hands and, um, you know, we, we were talking a little bit earlier and I, I've heard about, uh, some of the other uh, businesses and whatnot that, that you were doing, but, um, let's just segue a little bit here because, um, now you're working with software. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> a lot of people would think that's funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's because it is funny. It, yeah. Um, so you're, you're, you're an app company. Um, I mean, at least you have a really cool name and you're named after like Triaxle. I mean, I love that. Um, tell me, uh, you, you were, you were telling your story earlier and, and um, tell me how did it come about that you started Triaxle and 
I think that'll explain kind of some of what triaxle is. So how we got here. So yeah. I'm going to go very brief from my roofing days until the idea for triaxle. When I was on those roofs, I was building decks. I was doing those carpentry projects. I always had an interest in heavy equipment. I had a vision of being like a big civil contractor. What guy or, doesn't actually have an interest in heavy equipment? It just looks awesome. I mean, I, I spent my my younger days watching garbage trucks go down the road yeah. and, and, and playing with machines in the sandbox, and that never changed. They just got more expensive, and the, and the holes got bigger. Yeah. Um, so I always had that desire. I didn't have the capital. I didn't have the backing. I didn't come from a wealthy family. Um, I just wanted to do that. So as we got in years later, we're doing, you know, additions or home construction projects. You know, I started doing the work myself instead of subbing it out. And that led us into that. So um, 2010, we were building a home and we hauled off. A, I had a subcontractor doing the excavation and we hauled off. It was about 100, 150 loads of clean fill off the site to a farm that was probably only four or five miles down the road. It wasn't a really long haul as far as, you know, trucking goes. Right. But right. literally as soon as we were done, like the day <laughs> we were done with with mo removing all that material, the neighbor neighboring property, a homeowner, came up to the job site and said, hey, if you guys have any clean fill, I'd take everything you have. I have that big dip in my property right there. I would take it all. And I was like flabbergasted and scratching my head going, man, well, why didn't you come here two weeks ago? Like you yeah. could have just saved us tens of thousands of dollars and and made this a much quicker process. And that was kind of the time I was I was like, wow, there's got to be a better way to do this. He should have known that I was getting rid of this material and I should have known that he needed it and we shouldn't have to have this after the fact communication. So I figured, well, someday somebody will come up with this and, and my problem will be solved. And the years went on as we got into doing more of our own excavation work and paving, et cetera. And it was always a problem getting rid of fill, finding dump sites, you know, or you move town and, and where do you find the closest quarry or a place to dump stumps. And as time went on, it became apparent that, you know, technology is getting better and there's got to be a, a product to, to do this for us. And it was never there. So wow. I started taking, you know, small steps to to do something about it in our local area and talking with my local website designer about doing a clean fill networking site for Northeast PA. And as we got into it, you know, he was kind of the one that said, Matt, the internet's limitless. You don't need to limit this to Northeast PA. And, and that resonated. And I was like, yeah, you're right. So the idea got bigger, the vision got bigger. And I, I worked with him for probably about two years, but we didn't get anywhere. I, he was always telling me he was gonna do this, we were getting there and it kind of never happened. And uh, he came to me, you know, August of, I guess it was 21, and uh, I think it was 21. And he just said, I'm out. I, I can't do this. I, you know, this is well above my scope. It's just out of my realm. I can't do it. So that kind of forced my hand and, and started looking bigger and like, all right, well, I guess I have to go out of Northeast PA. I got to find somebody else that can do this. Right. Um, Started talking to my brother, Doug, who's our COO and the co-founder, and he gave a lot of outside input because I'm in a bubble. I'm in the construction industry. I have tunnel vision, and he started giving me ideas and input from somebody that was in an operational role for a flight medic company and different business insight. And we started putting our heads together, and, and we said, yeah, let's let's do this. Like this. I find it really interesting just the uh – the comment that you talk about with with an outside input, um, we typically don't even realize that we have tunnel vision when we're in the midst of things like that. Uh, what, what made you, other than just the the circumstances, but what made you realize I, I need outside input? Like, because I'm not a techie, <laughs> I'm not a tech guy, and I know yeah. I. There's a lot of things in my life where I I wasn't experienced at it or necessarily good at it or but I knew I could do it. But right. Developing right. an app is something where I, I put my foot down and said, you can't develop in an app. You're the guy that gets frustrated when your computer's not working right. You want to shove it off the desk or throw it out <laughs> the window, you know? So um, I'm, I'm not a tech guy. I, I'm now the C CEO and co-founder of a software company, and I'm not a tech guy. But I know from a practical, real-world experience standpoint what I would want that technology to do to make my life easier in the business that I'm in or, and also I know it can work for other people. 
So that's kind of how we got there. So my idea and vision of what it could be has to be translated to people that can develop and, and put it into a software. And Doug, my brother and partner, helps bridge that gap. He is much more um, he's, he's, he's much more technologically apt and, and adept to those things, and he can help bridge the gap between my vision, his vision, and the developers that are working on it. So it was very clear to me, like, number one, start with Doug. He's always been right. the tech guy. Every time I need a new TV or a computer in the house, hey, Doug, what, what do I need? Or, or Doug, you know, I have this bug or virus. Like, what do I do? So he helped bridge that gap to get to the next point to help kind of um, have some of those, you know, communications with our with our first developer and, and, and get that across. Okay. Well, I want to ask you a question. Um, but before I, you know, I mean, we're, I want to come back to this because I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about Triaxel app and and what it's doing and and what you guys are doing and what's coming in the future. Okay. Um, but I have a question for you. I ask everybody this question. Sure. And so the question is, what is that one thing that you can't live without? What is a tool or a piece of gear that Matt absolutely has to have? And you know, if you if you couldn't have anything else, what is the one thing that you want? So we're saying tool, not like family, not like... Yeah, either a tool or a piece of gear, um, because you're married, right? So yes. the first thing you should say is your wife, um, if you, you know, but I mean, we're, we're not, uh, we're talking about tool or gear. I mean, at this point, uh, tool, piece of gear, this is a tough one. And, and, and I'm the kind of, I don't know, I'm not really proud of my answer, but at this point, it's going to Well, be... I mean, I could help you, but I haven't helped anybody yet, so I'm yeah. not going to start with you. I mean, it's weird. I, I got to say, my phone. Like at, at this point, I mean, I'm, I, 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 I run my business from my phone. Yeah, and, and it's yeah. and it's sad to say, but it's now like it's where I'm at, and that's where we are. I couldn't, I couldn't run my business, run my life without my phone because it's it it communicates with my developers, it can communicates with my my large network that I'm now you know building across the country. Um, that's the tool. And yeah. for better or for worse, that's that's what I need. Well, I mean, you're not the first to have said that. And the reality is, uh, as much as I hate that answer as well, um, you know, it is the truth. I mean, I, I couldn't operate my business without my phone. I would love to try it for like a, a day, but then I think I'd, I'd it wouldn't work. Sure. Um, you know, in, in the current world that we live in, it, it would not work. Right. And it provides an opportunity for us to to do things and do business that we never could have done before. Absolutely. And I mean, that segues right into, I mean, of course you want your phone, obviously with the Triaxel app on it as well, right? Absolutely. You know? Everybody <clears throat> should have it on their yeah, phone. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but like with that, like even talking about technology and the things that we couldn't do, you know, like we use estimating software, things like that. And, and it promotes, I can remember when I started in the industry, we were faxing quotes mm -hmm. and it's like, um, as technology expands, uh, and I mean, if we go really far back, and I've said this before, the company that I worked for used to have like radios and a base radio that they could blow the horn in the truck so that you know that, that the office was trying to get a hold of you. Yep. So very different times, but technology has continued to advance. And I mean, 20, 30 years ago, we couldn't even have the conversation of on the internet or on an app being able to be like, well, who has... Phil, right. or who wants Phil, or who? So talk about a little bit more for for those that are listening. Just talk about a little bit more about what are some of the things that people can use the Triaxel app for. And and I know that you guys are still uh, in development or or developing it, or you're 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 kind of uh, changing some things and, and updating some things. But talk a little bit about more the uses and and how it. What do you envision? You know, in three years from now. Triaxel, how do you envision it, uh, envision it operating and making a difference in the workforce? I mean, my short answer is three years from now, anybody in the construction industry, civil industry, uh, landscaping, um, we want to be a part of your daily life <clears throat> in, in, in business. And we think we have a product that will do that. The initial idea was simply networking clean fill in Northeast PA. And then okay. it became, okay, let's, let's network clean fill in, you know, across the country. And as we were developing and, and starting with our first attempt at the local website, 
I did see one competitor come out and I was kind of bummed and thinking, oh man, somebody beat me to this. Um, but it became clear that their product wasn't really phenomenal and there's, there's room for competition. So well, I kept, all I kept competitors mean is that you're on the right track. Exactly. That's all of that. Exactly. Means. And they beat us to market and whatever. Um, so we came out with our V one app last year and what it does is it connects people in the industry that need to network clean fill. You can find your local or Let's, let's say you were coming from out of town and you're doing a job. You're coming down to Mannheim. You're, you came over from Pittsburgh. You're not really familiar. So the goal is find your clean fill sites, find your closest rock quarry, find your closest asphalt plant, where you can buy your pipe, where you can buy your materials. Basically, we want to build a network that helps you connect to the other users and solve problems. People that need something or have something to offer, we're bringing you together to make those transactions, whether it is for barter or for free on the clean fill side, or there's monetization <coughs> behind it, basically like a hyper focused search engine that is for the construction industry. So talk about a little bit like some people probably are listening. And obviously, if you're in the heavy civil world, you understand terms like clean fill. You know, you understand what it is to have something, you know, that is right there next to the job site versus five miles down the road, people are like, well, why does it matter that it's five miles away? And coming from someone who's had to experience those needs on jobs, um, I, I understand that. But for those that are listening that maybe are in a trade and and they're not really putting together w- what that might be, um, what what does that change for things overall? Time is money. Boy, that's the truth. Time is money, man. And our goal is to provide you with the most efficient, cost-effective solution for whatever it is that you need. Yeah. Just do the calculations. Diesel, four dollars a gallon, which is cheap. Or depending on where you're at. <laughs> so talking about where yeah. we're at with technology, yeah. would you have ever thought that you're saying four dollars a gallon is cheap ten years ago? I, I don't <laughs> like saying that. I don't like saying that. I think I actually paid three eighty nine at a truck stop by my house, but <clears> coming down here it's all over the place. Oh yeah. Um so let's just say you're hauling twenty miles. You got, you know, 10 dump trucks going 20 miles and you run those numbers at the, at the, you know, with the, with the fuel cost and the miles per gallon, et cetera. And then cut that, cut that down to five miles to a site that you didn't know was off a main road around a corner, but willing to accept that. Right. That's a big deal. That's a, that, you know, that's thousands of dollars in one day that you just saved. And I've had people, and I've had people call us and tell us that they have made those types of transactions. Uh, Dylan Mercer from D2 Contracting in Michigan, he was one of our early success stories. He sent me a message and said, dude, you, you saved me five grand today because I was going to haul all this material 30 miles away. And last minute, I looked on your app and I found a site. I contacted them. They took it. You cut my trucking in half and you saved me five grand. Like, that's what we can do. That's what happens. And, that, and that's amazing to see it working <laughs> like that. Um, I'm a big believer in, in what's called win-wins. Yeah. And so it's like, I love that because that wasn't just a win for him. It's also a win for the guy. It's like, I want Phil. Yeah. You know, and, Absolutely. and, and it's helping people, but like I I've been on jobs where they desperately were looking for Phil and if they couldn't find it with someone that needed it to be there, they were paying for it sure. to be delivered. Sure. And it's like, you can find someone who literally has a need that meets your need. And all within the app. Correct. And what you typically do now before, you know, before the technology is getting better is you're making phone calls. You're calling that buddy. Hey, hey, do you know where I can take this? Or you're looking on Facebook or like literally I used to leave. I used to leave my house after dinner the night before we would start a job in a, a town that I wasn't familiar with. And I would go drive around instead of spending time with my kids that night. I would drive around looking for signs that said clean fill wanted. So the next morning I could be prepared and, and have a plan for, for right. my crew. Um, that's asinine. That's yeah. ridiculous with where we are with technology these days. So, yeah. um, you know, and not only clean fill, you know, we're connecting you to other users. It, it, it's ba- Triaxel is a network. My idea started off with clean fill. My brother, Doug said, Matt, we're building a platform that connects, connects people that have something with people that need something. We can do that for everything within the construction industry. We're connecting a concrete subcontractor with a with a general. We're connecting, you know, um, 
everybody, anything to do with the construction industry, it is our vision and our goal to have you connect on our platform because it's business only. This is it's this is a B two B platform. You're not on Facebook dealing with Mrs. Jones that wants one wheelbarrow of fill or wants to know if you could bring her, you know, right. some wood chips. You don't have those distractions. Triaxle is meant to be business to business, solve your problem quickly, efficiently, and and make it painless. Yeah. And you know, we came out with our V1 app last year. Um, we we had we didn't get what we wanted from our first developer, but we got what we got, and we're proud of our vision and we're proud of our 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 plan and our potential, but we didn't get that in our first product. So we launched, we came out and, and we promoted it, but in the back of our minds, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to promote something that you're not really proud of. It's hard for me to stand behind something that I don't believe is the best that it can be. I, I want it to be better. So we made the decision last year after going out, doing Con Expo, doing some other trade shows, we went to the Dirt World Summit. We made the decision last fall to kind of say, you know what? This isn't going to cut it. It's, it's just not. People love our vision. They love what this can do, but it's not working. They're not getting notifications. You know, it's slow. So we made the decision to kind of scrap our first app and completely rebuild with um, new native products. And we're in development for that now. And they're going to be great and they're going to be powerful. But it's very hard to sit here and not have that available to the world right now. I, I think it's really funny just sitting here with a <clears throat> obvious tradesman. Um, and he's talking to me about web development and, and apps and, and, you know, it's just, that it's kind of, us. it's kind of comical, honestly, but yeah. it is the, uh, the quintessential tradesman mentality is finding solutions for problems that exist. Get shit done. That, that is really what it's about. And I love the fact that you're, you're talking about, so we, you know, we went out and, it, and it's not exactly what we wanted. And so we're, what you're not saying is, well, we're done. We tried it didn't work, you know, and you're, but what you're saying is, no, we want to make it better. Yep. And and we're going, we're, we're doing this. We're focusing on making it better. This is what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier just about um, failure and things like that. And, and it's like, you know, it, it really isn't a failure as long as you don't quit. We learned something. Yeah. And, and um, I think a lot of us in our stories, I, I think a lot of um, whether, whether I, you know, we talked about being in our early twenties and even how we got our starts. And, and it's like, when I was younger, I thought, well, I need to have this figured out. I need to understand this. I need to know that. And it's like, and I was even, I was extremely concerned about picking the wrong career. Sure. And I find it really interesting because in your story, um, you've done a little bit of everything and now you're in web development. And the point is a lot of times I think people are too afraid to move and they miss that opportunity cost. Absolutely. They, they miss that chance to get it. And I, I think when I started my first business, a friend of mine, uh, a really, really close friend, I, I called him up and I said, so this is what I'm thinking of doing. And I'll never forget what he said to me. And I was in my twenties. And if you're listening and you're in your twenties and quite honestly, personally, I, I think this expands even throughout life, but for sure, if you're in your early years, he said to me, he goes, what's the worst that could happen? He's like, you lose everything. He goes, you're 20. You don't have anything. Sure. Like he was like, what have you got to lose? Sure. And I, I think that I love hearing that that's something that you've kept and you're just continuing to press on through these roadblocks and things that come up. I heard a quote recently, or maybe not, a, maybe it was a statement, not a quote. And it resonates. I have failed more times than people, most people have tried. And, <laughs> and, and that, and that's yeah. the truth. And you can't be afraid to fail. And people have looked at me in town and kind of said, how do you do it? Because there was a time I had five or six different arms of MHW construction. We were crushing rock. We were paving. We were screening topsoil. We were selling landscape supplies. And people are looking at me and going, how do you do it? I'm like, I, I love it. I thrive on the challenge. I I'm not like I'm in business to make money. Everybody is. You have to support yeah. your family and yourself. But I like to look at something and go, that looks hard but I think I can do it. I'm going to, I'm going to try and I'm going to give it hell. And that's why I did everything. When one business kind of became, you know, was on cruise control and we had a good customer base, it wasn't challenging anymore. And yeah. I needed something else. And, and to the, to the younger kids out there, like I started off as a roofer and now I own a, a software company that's getting recognized nationwide. Yeah, come I, on. Did, I did not think yeah. that was going to happen, yeah. but 
it, it's kind of funny where life takes you. And, and some of my perceived failures at the time have been the biggest, you know, biggest things that have happened to me in yeah. my life or pushed me in a direction that I didn't, I didn't see, you know, six years ago at that time that it was going to lead me down that path. But just well, we're definitely going to, we're definitely going to talk about that a little bit later. Cause I love talking about people's failures. Cause I think, I think that's where the meat is. Sure. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, so you, you, you've built multiple businesses. Um, and I, I told you when we started that we don't edit anything. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, um, I, I don't want to lead you into something that you don't want to talk about, but I also, I want the line to bring value to people. And uh, I don't sit down with people just to, to have a random conversation. I, I want to talk about things that matter Sure. because you said it, time is money. And so we're sitting here spending money to talk to people. And so my hope is that someone is listening and the things that we talk about resonate and they connect with, whether it is you know, how failures only become failures if you give up, you know, and, and I love your statement there. You know, you, you're saying that, um, it's, you've, you've failed more than most people have tried. And I, I think that we get paralyzed by fear and we get trapped in that. And so then that's how we miss those opportunities. Sure. And so I, I want to talk about some of the experiences that you've had when we were talking earlier and, and I'm not going to get too into it, but I am going to ask you this question because as you've built multiple businesses, this is one thing I think that people need to understand and know. Whether you're an entrepreneur, you're a founder, or, or you, you want to start something, as you grow a business, you know, uh, it grows beyond yourself. And you end up working and getting surrounded with people. And I think it's important for us to recognize the truth of it, and that is that people can hurt people. Absolutely. You know, and uh, one of the biggest things in business – um, that I connect with you on is um, having to deal with, and, and you know, maybe this is too harsh of a word, but this is what it feels like in the moment, but having to deal with that feeling of betrayal, sure. especially if you are, you know, a founder, it's like uh, founders are usually pretty visionary, you know, and I, I don't know you all that well. We've been talking here for a little over an hour, um, not all live, but um Hearing you talk and whatnot, you clearly are a visionary guy. You, cl- I mean, my goodness, you're a roofer that now is a software developer, and you're talking about where you want Triaxle to be and what you want it to do. And somebody had to be visionary when we first talked about the iPhone, which changed everything. Sure. And, you know, the trades and construction is one thing that we're the last to market to change. Yeah. We are the last. We're a stubborn group. We, we are a stubborn group. <laughs> But the world does not run without us. Sure. You know. That's um, a fact. <coughs> I was just reading an article article this morning, the importance of data centers. You know, and, and last week there was the huge um, update that ruined flights all over the world, <laughs> you know, which was really interesting. But uh, none of that stuff can function without the people in the trades. Correct. None of it can. And so <clears throat> if you're out there and you're dealing with building something, whether it's a team of people, whether it's a business or whatever it is. My question for you is, as you've talked through the different things that you've dealt with, when you get visionary with your teams and you're like, oh, I really see that this person can be there and you invest time and money and part of you into people and then they they leave. They're like, I'm going to go do this. And sometimes they leave in ways that are um, downright painful and, and I'm always blown away by Sometimes it's really innocent on their side. They don't even realize it. Sure. Where they're like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go start my own business doing this. And it's like, uh, and they take half your clients and they take your work and maybe they take your people. I don't know. Have there been experiences like that for Matt? How has Matt dealt with that feeling? And, and how, do you, um, how do you work your way through that? How do you just decide not to throw your hands up and be like, I am just done? Well... There's a lot that goes into running a business and you, nobody is ever going to share your passion and your exact vision for a company. They can be with you. They can be there by your side, but they're never going to do the early mornings, late nights, share the stress and, and do everything that the, that the owner or the visionary does. Um, one of the examples that, you know, you want to talk about betrayal. One of the examples that I have is 
the the winter spring going into 2021 i had spent over 20 years running a business from my cell phone while operating a paver while running a machine while driving a triaxle while doing whatever i felt i had to do to make a buck that day or keep the keep the machine moving or or keep the wheels turning and and it became very apparent to me you know for many years before 2021 that i had to stop doing that that i was I was working in my business. Come not, on, this is good. Not for my business. And I decided, you know what? I have to stop. If I want to be successful and, and I want this to work, I've I've got to be the boss. I've got to be the director of this show. I can't be in the show anymore. <coughs> and at the same time, our first uh, development of Triaxel was going on. So 2021, I'm... So wait a minute, wait a minute. Also, to be in business, you, you need to be a little bit crazy. You have to have you, some balls. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you have to have some balls. Um, you, you have multiple businesses going on, and in that moment, you're like, let's start a software thing. Yes. Yeah. That is okay, yeah, that, that is why like you understand, but other people around me and down are like, what the hell is wrong with you, man? And I just look at them and go, I love it. I yeah. love it. It's a special I, kind of crazy. It's, it is. You have to be a bit nuts to do it, and I think yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs would tell you that. Yeah. I'm just one of those guys like... I, need, I thrive on the challenge. I, I need it. And if, if everything's going well, I'm too comfortable. Or I'm uncomfortable because it's yeah. going too well. I got to do something else. So 2021, we're starting with our first developer with Triaxel. And that's obviously time consuming, taking a lot of my time. I'm having meetings from the truck. You know, it's just becoming too much. And I realized... It always takes more time than you thought it would, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Oh, my word. And so I decided for the first time in my 20 years, the work boots are coming off. And the boss, you know, shoes or whatever going on. And I'm going to start managing my business the way an owner should. And I started talking with the guys on on my paving crew. Um, so at this point, I had a landscape yard. I had a manager. He was running that. Things were cool. Everything was great. I needed to oversee it and, and you know, help run it. But he's got it. I have a dock building business that is run by a foreman, Casey. He's been with me for over almost 15 years now. Wow. Phenomenal dude. Runs that show. That one's okay. I can just let that one go. But it was the paving and the excavating side that I was I always had to be there. And um, I'm a bit controlling, a bit of a perfectionist at times, but I also don't like callbacks. And when you put in a sewer line wrong and it's and it's not flowing right or you pave a big parking lot and it's got puddles, like those are expensive mistakes to repair. Yeah. So I always felt like I had to be there for those projects. Putting in a sewer line wrong really becomes a real shit yeah, show. It's a shitty problem. Oh, sorry, I couldn't <laughs> help it. Dad <laughs> neither, jokes. neither could I. I jumped on it too. Um so I decided, you know what, and I talked with my crew at the time and said, guys, you know, they basically told me, like, you've got to get out of our way. You're on your phone all the time. Like, you're in our way. Like, let us do the work. So for the first time in 20 years, I said, I'm going to hang up, hang up the work boots, and I'm going to run my business, and you guys are going to do the work, and I'm going to keep you supplied with endless work. And that's the way it was going to go. So I planned for that all winter of that year. And the week before the asphalt plants opened, uh, Jeff, who was going to be my paving foreman and run that, called me and said, I quit. And I said, Man. what? He said, I quit. I'm starting my own business. Wow. So what are you talking about? You were in my office two weeks ago, and we were talking about the crew. We needed to pick up one more guy. We needed a good roller man. You were just talking about this. He said, yeah, I know, but I wanted to start my own business, and I've been working with the banks, and they told me that I got approved. So he called me, he called me the day the bank called and said, yeah, we'll give you that big loan that you want for that equipment and that truck, and he quit. And wow. so finally, you know, after 20 years, I finally decided to to to, to put the boss shoes on and, and, and do it, and I planned for it for months in, at my office all winter, preparing spreadsheets, figuring out my estimating plan, like getting dialed in to have a kick-ass year go out, make some money, make these guys some money or, and have, you know, yeah. and it all blew up in my face. Everything, wow. it, it just blew up in my face. And I'm like, why did I do this? Had I just not taken myself off the crew and all that, like this wouldn't be a problem. So, uh, he quit. I had to jump on the paver, jump back on the crew. And he was more experienced than me at paving. Um, I brought him in because he was an experienced paver. I was not. And, right. and that's what I hired him for. So he ended up leaving and we we worked our way through like the next, you know, month and a half and I was so busy. I, I wasn't prepared to have to be on site. And and then, you know, I think it was like a month or so after he left, my second second in command right hand man, Nick, who had been with me for about seven years, oh, he quit. Man. He quit to go work for that guy. 
Wow. And I was just like, what the hell just happened? Why did I plan? <clears throat> like, the, my whole plan just blew up in my face. But what are you going to do? You can't stop. You got to keep trudging forward. But 2021 was the most stressful, hectic year of my life, trying to run those businesses, run a paving operation that I that I admittedly was not the most qualified you know, paver to do that. So I ended up hiring another guy, Frank, who came in and, and helped us out and got us through. But 2021 was just chaos. It was yeah. insane. I was stressed to the max. I was losing it. I, I, I just, I was just losing my mind. I, I was so stressed out. I was, I, I went up and I looked at a farm in upstate New York and I thought about selling all my shit and buying that farm and just moving up there <laughs> just to get away from the world. And then yeah. I realized, oh, I got kids. That's not really reality. That's not going to happen right now. But I did end up making some hard decisions and I decided that it's time, you know, with, with Triaxel coming around and I, and I have a vision for Triaxel that I think is it's really going to be something great, and we need a couple of years to really get it get it out there and show the world. But it's got some great potential. Seeing that hanging in front of me, knowing I can't I can't build a software company from the back of a paver or or in an excavator. It's time to start. It's time to let some of these things go. So I decided to get out of the paving and excavating business because that was the one that I had to be there full right. time on. Um, so I just simply sold off that equipment that fall. So let, let's just talk about that for a second there. Cause I think I recently heard this statement and I think this is what you're talking about, but it's like, I think as, as on, entrepreneurs and, and, and business owners and founders, sometimes we, we get confused in building a business and building a really good job. And, um, I mean, I have done this too and learned the hard way, but we're, we're talking here and you're sharing this story and it's like, um, if, if it's not something that can operate without you and you're not building that team of people. And I mean, these are your words of what you just said. It's like, you're, you're building a really good job, yep, but you're not building a business. Exactly. For many years, I looked at it like I'm saving, I'm saving a salary for a year. I'm saving 75 grand by doing yeah. the jobs of multiple people. And I did it that way for a long time. And and it, it worked for me for many years. I knew it wasn't like if you brought in an outsider that was great at running businesses, I knew he would look at me and go, you're an idiot. You shouldn't be doing this. Right. But it, it, it worked for me. And I was fine with that. But it but it became apparent that we were, you know, we were growing and the beast, you know, needed to be fed. I couldn't do that anymore. And I saw the writing on the wall. So I, I took action and, and took, you know, I made decisions and. And the first one was, let's get rid of, you know, after, you know, you were talking about betrayal, you know, Jeff left and my other guy left that, that year was chaos. And, and, you know, I was kind of pissed at them. Obviously I was really pissed at them at the time. Um, but I always kind of look at things like you always knew that that could happen. You, everything's well, I, a risk. And I you, think that's really important. And I think just to kind of come back to that and talk about that betrayal. And um, when you're a visionary person uh, and I've learned this through betrayal, as well. And it is nothing against those people when I say that word betrayal. That's what it feels like to me. Sure. And what I've learned is because of my visionary mindset, I can envision this plan for them for the next 10 years. Cause that's, I literally think in five year increments, mm -hmm. that's just the way my brain works. And the problem is that might not be their vision. And as, as founders and business owners, when we develop that vision, we begin to hold people like this. And we need to hold them like this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's essential in our ability to um, be able to move through and deal with those feelings of betrayal when people are like, you know what, this isn't for me anymore. And you even touched on that because there came a point where it wasn't for you anymore. You know, and I sure. think that's a, a real essential that that is important to talk about so that people in business uh, have a revelation, an epiphany you know, uh, a moment of uh, clarity that it's like, oh, it's okay that this isn't for me or this isn't for them. And how do we move through that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, going back to, to that, you, you want to treat your people good. You want them to be there. You want to be there for them. I, I try to treat my guys and the girls that work for me like family. But right. in the same sense, you have to understand this is not necessarily their life, their career for, for forever. Um, you know, there is a high turnover rate in the construction industry. That is a fact. And you want to treat them good 
and take care of them. But you also have to realize like when they leave for whatever reason that is, um, that's just one of those things that happens. And then that kind of like jades you a little bit for the next one, because then you see the next person coming in and you really want to mold them and take care of them and, and them do the same for you, knowing the whole time they could just turn around and give you two weeks notice or not just walk yeah. out the door. Yeah. So it's, it's tough to sometimes you lose that faith in people and that confidence that they're going to do the right thing. And when Jeff left, I don't think he really realized what he did. You know, he he was doing what he thought he had, to, what he needed to do for his family. His wife owned a restaurant, wasn't doing great because of COVID. Yeah. He needed to do his own thing. And I'm all for people bettering themselves and taking care of their family. Had he come to me that winter and said, Matt. There it is. There I, it is. I want him to do good. If he came to me that winter and said, Matt, really like doing this, but I got to do my own thing. It's what's best for me. We would have shook hands and I would have said, great. So if you ever need any advice, give me a call. Like, I'm happy to help you. This sucks. I don't yeah. need you doing this right now, but I've dealt with it <coughs> so many times. I'm used to it, right? When things well, and are that good. would have provided such an opportunity for him to actually build a business. Absolutely. And so it's like, uh, I mean, I don't want to get too into this, but it sounds like he's not even doing that business anymore. He's out of business. Yeah. And so I, I think what you're talking about there, we talked about this a little bit earlier, where it's like... Um, Communication. Mm-hmm. So so many times it's like we do something wrong or we look at it or, or we allow fear to drive a decision. Oh, well, that's a podcast all by itself. Sure. We allow fear to drive a decision where if we would just have an honest conversation with someone. I mean, imagine if he would have came to you and he'd been like, you know, hey, I'm feeling like I need to do this. He could even come to you and be like, is there any opportunity for me as obviously you're growing Maybe someday I could buy into ownership or have more of what is here. Like, I, yeah, I totally would have been open to. So I was paying him hourly at the right. at the time, and when he was going to take over the operation, he knew he was going up. But had he come to me and said, "Matt, I need more. I need yeah. more," and it's not greed; it's, it's just what I need, then I would have looked at that maybe even more uh, openly and said, "You know what? Like, our, we could have come to some agreement. Maybe you take." half of those profits. Now, maybe there's an opportunity for you to make, now that you're telling me this and, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for you to make significantly more money, me make money because you will be motivated to to do a better job and and stick with me. But instead of having that conversation, he hid that from me all winter that he was thinking about that. He left on with no notice, bad terms. And he he gave the business light. He gave entrepreneurship a, a shot for two years, and he's not in business anymore. And I saw on Facebook that he was done because he couldn't find employees and all that. And like, yeah, That's dude, a real I, could, I could have told you that was a problem. I, uh, you can't find yeah. him. You know, I could have told you that. And and I think the importance of part about what you're saying and and that that I think is important for people to hear is you don't know what you don't know, and You never can go wrong with being honest with someone. We talked about honesty a little bit earlier. And that's not being transparent and telling everybody all your stuff. But being honest with someone is not hiding things from them. And that is where the problem comes from. When we when we don't communicate about things, it's like we we miss an opportunity. You know, and it's like because of a lack of a conversation, there's a missed opportunity there. And and there's a damage to a relationship. And let's just talk about that for a second. Business in general is all about relationship. Mm -hmm. It is all about relating and and knowing, hey, I can, I'll never forget we, our our sister company won a huge job and it didn't matter what our bond rate was. It didn't matter, you know, um, what, what our financials were or anything like that. They called us, they hired us for the job because we had built relationships that said we can do this job and we can do it better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't ask for any of that stuff. They just said, we want you to do the job based on the relationships that we see. Yep. It's all relationships. It is all relationships. That's... And the other stuff, it's, it's, uh, it's um, what do you call it, peripheral. But it's like if one thing matters, it is the importance of that relationship. And the only way to build true, real relationship is to have honest and real conversations with people and communicate what's really going on. Relationships and reputation – I mean, they go a long way. You know, I know guys, I got guys that I would I would do 100 grand worth of business with on a handshake yeah. and, and do the whole project and know that they're going to pay me when it's over. And there's other guys, I won't work with them for five grand unless we sign a contract because I'm, I know that they 
from you know history that they have a bad reputation of paying people, yeah. and that's well. There are some guys that I wouldn't do five grand to work with, even if they signed a contract. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't mean I anything. was giving them the benefit <laughs> of the doubt there, but but yeah, it, relationships yeah. are big, and 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 that's what it's all about. And I've I've spent twenty years in my local network of Northeast PA. Um, people can say what they want about me, whatever, but I've always treated people fairly. I've always tried to do the right thing. I've always tried to be honest with my employees, my customers. And that went a long way with building my business because people worked with us because they trusted us and they yeah. wanted to work with us. Um, and, as, and as soon as you start getting that reputation that you might be losing that a little bit, I mean, that word travels a lot faster than than the good that you're doing, for sure. Well, yeah, I, I once heard that, uh, you know, you can do 10 things right. Am I gonna, how am I going to say this? You could do 100 things right, um, but if you did 10 things wrong, you need to do 10,000 things right to recover from Absolutely. It. People don't you know? they don't pick up on the the right things. No. But they see no. the, the one wrong. Well, it's all you need to do is watch the news. We don't talk about all the good that's happening in the world. Nope. It's we all... just talk about all the negative. Absolutely. Um, I was just, my son the other night, he, uh, you know, he's, as he's getting older and, and getting more interested in different things, there's a, a new movie coming out called Reagan, and he was very intrigued in it. And so we were watching some different clips from Reagan, and I found this really interesting, um, an old Johnny Carson uh, clip with Ronald Reagan, and Reagan is there, and he's talking about all the things that are going wrong in the world, and this is hysterical to me. Same things that they're talking about in the news today. It's like a cycle. It is. And then then he makes this statement. He said... And if you took all of this stuff that we deal with here in the United States and made it three times worse than what it is now, we still live in the greatest place in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I think that we get so distracted and so caught up in all of the bad that's out there. I mean, my goodness, you're building an app that we couldn't have built 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's huge. Yeah. Well, and, and your app is even all about communication. It and is. it's all about communication that... When it's not communicated, you have no idea that there's a guy right at the end of your site that needs Phil, and you're driving five miles away. Sure. Definitely. I mean, we talked about that earlier. Just you, you had an experience um, where you 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 went to an event or whatever, and you wish that they would have just given some feedback and say, hey, we missed it, you know. And you wish that they would have just said, you know, this is where we missed it. And we can't afford to give you anything or anything, but we acknowledge that we missed it. Right. I think that's the biggest thing for me with people is the importance of us being upfront about the mistakes that we make. Because sure. if you think that people don't see it, you are deluded right. and not self-aware that, I mean, people see when you make mistakes. It just is the reality of it. You might be able to cover this up or hide this, but it eventually is going to come out. When I was a kid, I'll never forget this. Uh, my, my mom would say to me, well, the truth, it always comes out. Mm -hmm. It always comes out. It might not come out today. It might not come out tomorrow, but it will come out. You know, and it's like, well, then, then why are we trying to hide the truth? Why are we trying to cover that up? Because it's actually really painful. And if we just, if we communicate that and we talk about it, honestly, then people don't have any power over you either. Sure. And you can actually deal with it and improve. Moms are great, aren't they? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, how did my mom put it? And I don't know if I'll get the wording right. But if if you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember your lies. <laughs> I love that line. And that, that's, that's the truth. The truth. Easy you, to you see these people, politicians and people out there, they say one thing, then two days later they say this, and then they get caught. Well, if you just told the truth the whole time, you wouldn't have to worry about your story because it's the same story every time. And and I try to live by live by that. And like you said, honesty doesn't mean always telling everything. Right. We have some really awesome big plans with our app that I'm not going to talk about right now because it'd be foolish because we're not right. there yet. But you know, I, I'll give you the the overall general gist of, of what's going on and stuff. But I've always tried to do that. And whether right, wrong, or not right or wrong, but whether you like it or not, yeah. you're going to get the truth from me, and you're yeah. going to get honesty. And if that means we can't do business, great. Let's get that done with right then and there. Yeah, come on. Instead of you'll save a ton of money. Yeah, <laughs> in, instead of hiding it. And I can't stand, you know, for years, you know, I've always had friends that like dance around something, even something as silly as like you know, yeah, I'll come over tonight and hang out. And then they don't. And you call them and say, why? They give you a line of bullshit. Like, 
just tell me you're you yeah, didn't want to. Like exactly. why are you why must you lie about something so silly? Like this doesn't matter. Well, the problem with lies is once you do it, it gets easier every time. Yeah. Every time it gets easier and easier and easier. And um and we're lying to ourselves if we say we never lied. Sure. I, I literally was on a job site the other day. Oh wow, I'm gonna get real here. Here we um, go. And you know, I was in an intense conversation and I said something and it wasn't exactly true. And and just to be clear, uh, not exactly true is not true. <laughs> it, it, is, sure. it, is, it is not true. Sure. And, you know, I, I framed it in a certain way. And this is where it gets important. I literally woke up and I was like, I said that. Oh, that wasn't true. This is how you deal with it when you lie if you don't want it to become a thing that you do. Mm-hmm. I had this conviction that it would not leave me alone. And so I picked up the phone and I called the guy and I said, this is really awkward. I said, but I just got to tell you, I said this the other day and that wasn't a hundred percent true. That's awesome. You know, I said, and, and, and I said to him, I said, I just need to tell you, I'm sorry. I lied to you. Yeah. And I said, um, this wasn't a hundred percent. And he was almost like, I can't believe you're called. This is so not a big deal. Like, right. but this is what's important about it. If I wouldn't have done that, then the next time it would be that much easier to go a little farther sure. and a little farther and a little farther. And then, then you're not only lying to other people, but you're lying to yourself, which is the worst sure. because then you have no idea what's even really going on. And that's a huge problem that we deal with in, in construction, in the world, in every aspect of things is when we get to the point where we're even lying to ourselves, well, then we don't know what the truth is. Absolutely. And then failure is there. Uh, two things regarding that one i have a friend sean who's he's 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 been always been a a good friend and he's a believer in what i do and he sees what i do and he's he's proud of it and he said something he's like i can't wait to see you become a politician someday (laughs) and and i said that's not going to happen i'm too honest to be a politician and that's just that's just the way it is because i feel like regardless of the best intentions that you might have when you get into that stuff you get caught in this web where you have no choice but to, to play their games and, and go down those roads. So I don't think I'll ever be a politician, but who knows? We'll, we'll see. And the other thing is um, regarding the lying. So when I sold my landscape supply business two years ago, I sold it to my shop in stone. The owner's name is Bill Ruick. He's a phenomenal businessman in Northeast Pennsylvania, very successful, owns a bunch of different things. And it's, it's really hard to get Bill's attention and, and, and get him to – He's a great guy, but he is so busy just to get him to even like show up for a meeting. We were talking about him buying my business and even to get him to come down and do that. It's like, I'm getting impatient. Like, hey, Bill, come on, you know, come on down. Right. And he came one, down one day and we're sitting on a picnic table outside after the the yard had closed for the day. And Bill's six foot something, big dude, mustache. <laughs> like he's an intimidating guy if in, until you get to know him and um and and he's sitting there talking. He's like, so tell me something. Tell me about your neighbors around here. How are they? And I'm like, you know, we have an eight-acre commercial property, but there's residential houses behind us, and we're right on Route 6 and 11 in Dalton. I'm like, well, that guy there, he's cool. That guy there, he's a township supervisor. He loves us. You know, he just says, keep the dust down, you know. Right. That guy, cool. And I said, that guy over there, he's an asshole, <laughs> that, that guy there. And he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, he gives us a hard time about our firewood processor, and he gives us a hard time about this. And, you know, I, we, we had a back and forth. And after the fact, he's like, I got to tell you something. I'm like, what? He's like, I knew about that guy. I, I yeah. knew that. I was te- like, and he didn't say I was testing you, but he was testing Absolutely. Me. And, and he just said, ah, he, like his way of saying it was like, oh, yeah, you know, my daughter said something about that. But, but right then and there, I gained Bill's trust. I'm trying to sell him this property. Absolutely. And I, and I stood to make a nice profit off of it. And I feel like a lot of people will do whatever they have to to do that. But right then and there, I was li- willing to lose that deal. I, I didn't want to lose the deal. I didn't think I was going to. But me telling him that guy there is a problem and he's going to give yeah. you a hard time. And I told him and he was like, thanks. Appreciate it. You know, he appreciated that honesty. Now, you know, since then, sitting down with him, he's, you know, it's really cool to hear from him. He's like, he's like, you are one of the most honest people I've ever done business with. And that's why we do business with you. Yeah. Um, so that that's big. Had I had I said, oh, everything's cool. Nobody gives you any problems. He would have never trusted me from that day forward. Not saying he wouldn't have bought the property because he can handle that guy. Not a problem. But that was like where our relationship kind of was like sealed in, in my eyes because he... 
like I didn't know that he knew about that guy, and he right. didn't know that I knew. But I told him the truth, and he appreciated it. And he said, "Yeah, whatever. He won't bother me." I'll just, he's like, "If I have to, I'll buy his house or something." Like yeah. that. You know, I'm like, "Yes, do it." Uh, so that was cool. Yeah. But it just, you know, yeah. relationships, trust. You can't beat it. It, yeah. it. it goes. No contract in the world, no piece of paper can beat the the sense of trust that you have with somebody once you build that relationship. Yeah, I once heard a guy, um, which this was interesting that he said this because I knew I wanted to work with him. He said. Well, a contract is a negotiation, and we're negotiating that right now, and hopefully we never, ever talk about it again. Sure. That's the goal. The point is we're literally putting our word on paper and saying this is what we're going to do. And, you know, you should throw – there should be some flags being thrown on the field if you're um, – I've been in contract negotiations where guys are like, well, we don't need to put that on paper because we're going to do it this way anyway. We're going to do what's right. And it's like, okay, well, then put it on paper. Yeah. I literally sat in a negotiation once for two hours going round and round and round with, well, this is what you're saying you're going to do. Put it on paper. Well, we're saying we're going to do it, and we do it. So why do we need to put it on paper? Yeah. And it was like this big <laughs> – we just went round and round and round until finally they put it on paper, and then guess what? They didn't do it. But since we had it on paper, then yeah, we made them do yeah. it. So they, that was their tactic. They knew. Yeah. 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 That's, that's crazy. And you want to trust people, man. You oh, wanna, man. You want to believe everybody's good and – and, you know, 20 years in business in Northeast PA, I know who I can trust and who I can't for the most part. Sometimes yeah. people will stab you in the back, um, but word travels fast. And it's like, why do you even try to do business like that? You're really like, I look at the long term, the, yeah. the long range. Some people are so worried about that month's, you know, buck or, or whatever, and they kind of lose sight of, of. Very short-sighted, yeah. You know, like, hey, we're. I don't know. It's just kind of funny to me. I, I think it's important to uh, the longer that I'm in business and the longer that I'm alive, the more that I realize the importance of, um, you know, you, you want to have a positive outlook. And like you say, you want to trust people. And that's important. Um, but it's like I can remember someone making a comment to me when I was younger, like, man, you have rose colored glasses on. And it's like I want to keep rose colored glasses on. Uh, they might be I, they're shattered and broken. But I still want to be looking at people through those glasses. Sure. And and if I see the cracks and things like that, which I will learn, like you don't want to not take a chance on people, but you can take an intelligent chance. Absolutely. When I when I talk about that contract, it's like I wanted to believe him. And so I I asked him and I made him, you know, agree to a contract that put his words on paper. And it's like, and then it turned out that he wasn't telling the truth. You were right the whole time. Your suspicions. We're well, and it's like, and but that's not a reason to not move forward, but you can move forward in an intelligent way. Sure. So Absolutely. So we've reached that point where um, I want to ask you a question. We talked a little bit about it earlier. I gave you a heads up. But here's my question for you because, and, and we've, we've even touched on this throughout uh, the podcast here today, but I believe that value comes from us being <laughs> honest and truthful about the mistakes that we've made. Okay. And, you know, failure is only failure if you quit. But for me, when, when I was uh, growing up and, and learning the trade, um, I, would, I would ride in, you know, a service van or whatever with these guys. And uh, different old timers would share things that, whether it was a practical mistake or sometimes I even had people share things with me that were just life mistakes that they made. And it really helped me to uh, learn and not have to make that same mistake myself. So for you, in an, in an effort to be real and authentic, what's a mistake that Matt has made that he's willing to share with those who are listening that they might be able to learn from? And you shared some earlier, but you can share that or if you have something different than as we've talked through the podcast here. But what's a mistake that you've made that you feel like you've learned from that might benefit others? I think something that stands out now is not asking for help. Ooh. not asking enough questions. So you're saying you rode in that van and, and that older gentleman kind of mentored you and talked to you. So when I started off in business, I was, I was alone. Yeah. I didn't, I started off when I was 19 unofficially. Um, and, and I was alone and I, I had that one partner that I was working with and then he bailed. So I kind of, for many years, I didn't ask questions. I didn't ask people how to do stuff. My mother has been a huge 
mentor and advocate. She's the one that pushed me to start my own company when I said, that's awesome. When I said, I can't do this, you know, me and Doug split ways. She's like, start your own business. I'm like, I don't know how to run a business. She's like, yeah, but you can do it. You yeah. know? So she's, she pushed me. But I think what's awesome today is, you know, social media is so bad in so many ways. You see all this negative shit being put out, but it's so great for these younger people getting into business to learn from other people all across the country, learn from their mistakes. There's, there's guys that, you know, run a business, but then also make extra money, you know, promoting themselves or talking about, you know, or, or being coaches and whatever. But I think one of my biggest mistakes is I went through a lot of my younger years just <clears throat> going and doing my own thing and, and not asking people for help or advice. I felt like my competitors were competitors for a reason. Why would they ever teach me something? Why would they ever answer a question? So I made mistakes underbidding things. I was yeah. I was working too cheap when yeah. I when I was first starting out. I even had a contractor tell me, uh, he, you know, at one point I was doing a lot of roofing work. He's like, "Hey, just so you know," he's like, "You're too cheap," and I'm like, "Shit, I thought I might be, but <laughs> uh, you know." And then you know, yeah. 15 years later, we have a reputation for being the most expensive guys <laughs> yeah. around um, because we didn't have to chase the work; it, it came to us. So I think what ask the question, reach out, call, call that, you know, call that perceived competitor and say, Hey, I know this might sound weird, but you want to go have a coffee. You want to go sit down and, and talk about this. Cause I saw you did this, or I see you, you completed that really hard job. And I have one coming up that might be similar. And I was wondering if maybe you, you would help me out. I, I always felt like you had to keep everything kind of really close. Yeah. And obviously in business, it's competitive. You have to keep certain things close, but, but also don't be afraid to ask the question, ask for a mentor, talk to people. I think that was one of my downfalls at the time. Yeah. Um, I was told, you know, hey, you you know, you need to have QuickBooks. You, sh you should run QuickBooks and that's how you're going to do your accounting. Okay. That makes sense. So I got QuickBooks. I didn't know how to use QuickBooks. There was a time I remember early on my QuickBooks balance was like negative $400,000, <laughs> but I knew in my head down to a hundred bucks, what was in my bank account. Yeah. And it wasn't negative 400. I, I just didn't know how to, to do it. So I ended up asking a family friend about it. He came over and uh, tried to get it straightened out. And he's like, wow, this is a mess. Like, this is bad. And, and uh, Mike Kennahan, he, he helped me for years after that and didn't ask for anything in return. He, he came out and helped me get my book straight and keep that stuff rolling. Um, and without him and, and that, that help, um, I, you know, who knows where I would have gone with that. So I think the biggest thing is I was afraid to ask for help. I was afraid to put myself out there and look like a fool or look like somebody that maybe didn't know everything or, and I didn't want to show my competitors or other people in the area that it's not until like later on where I started working with other people. Um, and I realized, you know what? A lot of them, they will be willing to give you some advice as long as they know that you're cool and you're not out there to steal yeah. what they've done. Um, one example, a guy named Dave Patterson, uh, unfortunately, he passed away in a motorcycle accident two years ago. But I needed a state, I had a road job that we were doing, and I needed a state certified paving contractor to do that road. I knew of Dave. I, yeah. He was a local, local guy. And we had mutual friends. Never really met him, never shook his hand. But I had another paving contractor that was going to do this road paving for me. And they kept jerking me around. They kept not showing up. And I had to get this contract done. I had to get the road back open. So somebody said, call Dave. I was like, well, Dave's a competitor. I don't think he's yeah. going to come do this. I called Dave. Dave and I worked for years after that. We shared jobs. He would send one my way or I would call him and say, hey, Dave, I got this big parking lot. I can't handle it. You want to look at it? Absolutely. Yeah, check it out. And that was that was one where like, you know, I, I thought for years, Dave probably doesn't like me because I sell firewood and he did too. He paved and I did too. But when it came down to it, Dave and I ended up getting along great and we had a mutual respect. And and he said to me one day, he's like, Matt, I would rather have you as my competitor. Our pricing is comparable. Yeah. You're not out there dirt cheap. You're a good guy. You guys try to do good work. He said, I would rather have you as my competitor than somebody else. So that was like one of the times where I realized, you know what, after all these years of not, not speaking up, not asking the question, I finally did it and look at the results that, that you got from it. So, so if you had to go back in time and tell your younger self something to do differently, then 
it would be to ask the question. Be ask the question. Ask yeah. the question. Approach that guy, you know, at the gas station, that truck, you know, that company that you admire, and, and say, hey, I know you don't know me, but would you mind giving me a little insight in how you did this or, or yeah. what you do or some of your tricks? Um, yeah, I think that would be my advice for sure. I, well, I think that's good. And I think that uh, I think that's really important. It, it talks about just the importance of, I think it's Patrick Lencioni that says, uh, humble, hungry, and smart. Mm-hmm. Um, and it starts with humble. Being humble enough to ask the question, um, being hungry enough to, to go after it, those things make you smart enough to keep doing it. And so um, the importance of being humble, hungry, and smart, um, and going after those things in that order, if we're, if we're not recognizing the humility that we need to have um, and, and going after things with a humble heart, we're never going to ask the question. It won't matter how hungry you are. It won't matter how smart you are because it will provide failure in a detrimental way. Absolutely. So, for sure. So uh, Triaxle is uh, planning on coming out here. You guys are working some things out. Yeah. Um, and uh, can you share with us when you're coming out, or you don't want to share that yet? Well, we're hoping it's early next year. First, early next first year. First quarter of next year. So Triaxle is live. We're live in the app stores. We have a functioning app. It's just not what we want it to be. It's not, it's just not as powerful as it needs to be. And quite frankly, it just, it doesn't work phenomenally all the time, but we are live in the stores. Our I web, love the honesty. Our, you're it, literally, you're literally living out what we just talked about for the past hour. You got to practice what you preach, man. It's, yeah. I cannot sell a product that I'm not proud of. Some people can do that. They can, right. they can go out and it, whatever it takes to make a buck, but I cannot stand there and tell you Triaxel is awesome when I know it's not awesome right. yet. I can't do that. That's not who I am. I have to believe in something to sell it. So we are live. It's functioning. You can sign up. You can use it. People are making connections every day. It's working. But it's not what we want it to be. And, we, you know, it's a V1 app, our first run at software development. I don't think we did too terribly bad. Yeah. Um, but we have a long ways to go. And right now we have a product that we're working on that will launch hopefully first thing next spring. If not, it'll be in the summertime. Um, same concept, just better executed and it's going to to work phenomenally and instant connections like you you know you make a post that you need something we want that to happen instantly and the thing with what we're doing is it's a network networks don't just pop up miracle like it's you know they have have, to be built they have to be built and we have a lot of work to do and that's the tough thing with our gig is if you come on our platform and you go looking for something and there's no solution for you there you're going to be a little bit disappointed, yeah. but you have to realize, you know, the more you help, like we need our customers and our, and our users to help us promote the product as well, because the bigger the network, the more successful everybody's going to be with it. And we've had that, you know, we've had people sign up in, you know, some small town in Ohio and I reach out to them and say, Hey, how you doing? They're like, yeah, there's nobody on, there's no connections. I'm like, I get it. I realize it. You're the first, we need you to tell your buddy and we yeah. need you to help. And then, you know, right. At that same time, we're up against the fact that our product isn't working phenomenally. It's, it's not giving you the proper push notifications. You're not getting the instant c- connections because the product's not doing what it's supposed to. Um, but in the new version, it will. So it it's a fun, it's a fun, different avenue that I've taken with this one. I, I was in my um, local network for 20 years in Northeast PA, and now we're dealing with people all across the country. I know a little bit about that. It's it's uh, I don't know if fun is the word that I would use. It's different. For me, it, um, networking with people all across the country. I love networking with different people. It's just uh, it, it's uh, so much bigger than what I'm used to. It is. And it, yeah. it is. It is much bigger. And but it opens up your eyes too. yeah, to see what sure. everybody's doing. Um, well, and LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn was dealing with the same thing that you're dealing with now when they launched and they started because business people were like, eh, it's like Facebook. I'm not into that, you know, and it's like um, it's become something now where there's a network of people and they're they're there. But they they started and you're trying to build and promote a network that isn't you know a network yet. So it's like if you're if you're listening, uh, get out there and download the app. Yeah, you know, and uh, and don't be deterred by what you see today because there right. is something really great coming. Uh, you know, in eight eight to ten months, it's like a chicken and egg thing. Yeah. And which one is it? Is it the chicken or the egg? Because exactly, you, you need the network built for it to be successful, but you can't build it without 
success happening within the product. So it's it's a different it's a different business for us, but um, we're confident that it's going to get there and with the right product and, yeah. and the right support. Um, well, and, and it's only going to make it about. better even if people download the app today because they're going to be in the network. Absolutely, and, and it's going to increase that network. So yeah, um, you know, I would if you're listening, uh, go download Triaxel, the only app. Out there on the Apple Store that says Triaxle, so the only one, yeah, the only one, it's so you can't one. miss it. So, well, Matt, I really appreciate you stepping up to the line and having this conversation. Um, you know, you you traveled a bit to get here. I really appreciate that. I appreciate your investment and uh, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, uh, it it really, I think it it matters. It makes a difference. Um, and the more people that can see what you're doing. And the way that you're doing it, I think, will be effective in changing our industry, which is what we need to be about. Absolutely. So. Well, I appreciate you having me. I like what you guys are doing as well. And uh, I think by working together, you know, we can all make this industry something really great and, and provide a great future for the up-and-comers. Absolutely. So, thanks again. All right. Hey, thank you very much. All right, that's it. We're out. Awesome. That was an hour.